once the recording comes. Okay, the recording is on. Let's um, take a moment to pray together and then we will get started. Could I ask somebody to please uh, pray with the class today and uh, we will start. Anybody wants to pray? So can I pray? Go ahead, go ahead, Yes. Yeah. So let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you, God, for your majesty. Thank you, Lord, that you are omnipotent, you are omnipresent, you are omniscient, and you are omnipotent, God. We serve mm -hmm. the God who is everything. We serve the God who is enthroned. Lord mm -hmm. Jesus, we pray this time, Father God, as we are learning about this season, Father God. We commend ourselves to you, Father God. We humble ourselves and we come into your throne, Father God. We ask you the more of your revelation. We ask you more of your grace. We ask you the more of your understanding, Father God. Help us to understand the things, Father God. We pray, Pastor As we submit Pastor Asis to your mighty hand and we all, student, Father God, we come to you, Father God. And Lord Jesus, we give you all the praise and honor to you, Father God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this time, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we will, uh, we are on this course on developing the human spirit. And um, we hope to wrap up things today. Uh, I might take a little extra time. Uh, if, if it's okay with all of you, you could stay on a little longer. It just depends on our interactions, uh, how much time that goes into that. But um, uh, hopefully we'll cover um, the ground that we need to finish um, and complete things. So we were talking about faculties of the human spirit and uh, the last two classes we covered or we talked a little bit about these, the five faculties of the human spirit uh, that we can see in scripture uh, we talked about seeing, hearing, feeling, or sometimes we use the word sensing, uh, but this is not to be mixed up with physical sensing, right? So we're talking about sensing or feeling in the spirit. And then uh, we talked also about the sense of uh, 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 smell and taste or taste and smell. Uh, which sometimes does happen, and it's not very common, but we must become very familiar with the first three, seeing, hearing, and feeling. Now, um, what we have stressed uh, in the earlier classes is that now we need to develop these faculties. So all of us have these faculties in our spirit, the human spirit. God has given us the ability, uh, these faculties, but we need to develop them, the spirit faculties. So I want to just share a little thought here um, on where God's prerogative versus our development meet. That means there are times God just moves sovereignly on his own accord. And he causes our eyes, you know, he, he enables, I mean, he just says, look, I want to show you the vision, here it is, you know. And uh, uh, whether, regardless of the spiritual development the person has undergone or has gone through, they may have a wonderful spiritual encounter and experience where they see, hear, and feel one amazing things, you know. Uh, take, for example, the Apostle Paul, or at that time he was Saul, he was uh, uh, totally against the Christian faith at that time. Uh, and he was going to actually, he was on his mission to persecute Christians, but he has such a powerful spiritual encounter. He sees, he hears, he experiences everything. So that was completely God's prerogative. That means that is something God did sovereignly. He just moved and Saul had a powerful encounter. Or there are times like John and some of the prophets in the Old Testament 
where, you know, they're caught up in the spirit and they have wonderful spiritual experiences. Uh, and, and you could say, you know, there are times God sovereignly moves and he causes people or enables people to have these kinds of experiences because he, he wants to get something across. But at the same time, we must understand that we have a responsibility to develop our spirit faculties. So, you know, we can't just sit down and say, okay, if God wants to get something across to me, you know, he'll just get it across and I, I don't have to worry. Well, it is true God is sovereign and he can move that way. But he has called us to grow, right? To grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grow in our inner man. You know, Paul writes about it. He says, be strengthened in your inner man by his spirit. So the inner man needs to be developed. The inner man needs to be strengthened. And part of it is developing our spirit faculties. So that means there is the normal communication that God, God has with us by his spirit. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, the Holy Spirit is bearing witness with our spirit. That means he is communicating to us on a day-to-day -day basis. And for that day-to-day -day communication, communion with God and receiving from God, our spirit faculties need to be awakened and sharpened so that we can receive those day-to-day -day communications from God. And if God wants to give any one of us something very spectacular, like, you know, being caught up into heaven or uh, some angelic visitation, or that's completely God's uh, decision. You know, that's, that's a sovereign decision. But from our side, we should be spiritually alert, spiritually awakened, and our faculty should be spiritually sharp so that on a day-to-day -day basis, and, and you know, we, we need to make so many decisions. Uh, we need to, and some decisions could be very important. You know, uh, they may have long-term impact on our life here on earth. Uh, you know, where to live, what to do, uh, should I say yes or no to an opportunity, uh, so on and so forth. So in all of these things, we want to hear from God. Will God speak to us? Of course. But he's not going to speak to us in a spectacular way, like send an angel and talk to us or, you know, take us up in the third, the third heaven. That's not the norm. The norm is the spirit bears witness with our spirit. And in order to receive that guidance from God and whatever he wants to, in our day-to-day -day basis, our spirit faculties, we need to keep on developing. So I want us to understand you know, uh, uh, both sides. We are not ruling out either. You know, so in talking about developing the human spirit, we are not saying it solely depends on us. No, God is speaking. We need to learn to hear. But it is God, you know, who at times can go beyond where we are spiritually. Uh, uh, and But that's completely his decision. Okay. So, I want to uh, just pick up from where we paused last class, last week. I'm going to share the PDF. Right. So we started talking about training our spiritual senses. And um, we said that, you know, having understood that our spirit has these five faculties, it's up to us to train our spiritual faculties. And one of the ways by which our senses, our spiritual faculties are, are, are trained is by engaging meaningfully and uh, you know, with the word of God, right? So Hebrews 5, 13, 14, the, uh, the writer of, uh, of Hebrews is uh, emphasizing, you know, uh, solid food uh, in contrast to uh, milk, right? And he's saying that if we engage with solid food, uh, we of course mature and it helps train our senses to discern good and evil, to discern things, to know what, what God is saying, to know what's not of God, all of those things. So the word of God, uh, by just engaging with the word, it's going to train our spiritual faculties. Right? And then um, uh, uh, Hebrews 4 and verse 12, it tells us that the word of God penetrates uh, to the division of soul and spirit. That means, uh, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So it's the word of God that goes way down and helps us distinguish. It draws a distinction with what is soul 
or his spirit, right? So the more we engage with the word of God, we are going to be able to differentiate uh, what is the, uh, the voice of the spirit versus the voice of the soul. You know, where do we draw the, the distinction and how do we separate um, the two? So, um, uh, so that, that's one very important way by which we train our spirit faculties. It is to engage with the word, meditate in the word, uh, receive revelation from the word uh, as we are engaging with our spiritual faculties are being trained and we're able to uh, differentiate, right? Now, uh, a, a, a big challenge, uh, I think I did mention this last time, a, a big challenge for all of us is how do I know that what I'm seeing or hearing or think I'm hearing or think I'm feeling or sensing in my spirit uh, is actually from the Holy Spirit versus my own soul, my own emotions at work, right? How do I draw the distinction, right? So uh, it, it is a learning process or a training process, right? That means uh, we are going to learn how to do this, right? We are going to learn how to recognize what's coming from the Holy Spirit, what is our own soul or emotions, uh, imaginations at work, right? We are going to learn how to differentiate this. But uh, so part of the learning process, like I said, is first is to you know, spend a lot of time in the word of God, uh, uh, meditate in the word, feed yourself with the word, uh, and that's going to help in the soul development or learning process. The second is for us to uh, learn from our mistakes, right? So uh, we will make mistakes, okay? And and remember, mistakes is, 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 is something from our side. It's not that the Holy Spirit is making the mistake or God is making the mistake. That's not, no, it's not God who's making the mistake. It's from our side because we are learning uh, as born again believers, we are learning how to recognize what God is saying and how to differentiate that from our soul. So it is okay to make mistakes. Uh, we own up to our mistakes. We recognize our mistakes. We learn from our mistakes. You know, so example is if you made a decision and uh, uh, if you made a decision and the um, you subsequently find out that, hey, may, I, I made a wrong decision, then you, you go back in your own mind and you review, you know, where did I go wrong? What went wrong? How, you know, maybe I didn't check sufficiently if what I thought I was feeling was really from God or was it my own soul, my own, my own personal imaginations and feelings, right? So you go back, you review, you understand. And uh, that's how you um, learn how to make, uh, you know, you differentiate what's happening. Just a minute at this, I need to pause here one minute. Just one minute.
Okay, sorry for that interruption. Somebody came here and oh, I just had to handle it. Okay, um, let's go back to where we were. Yeah, so we said that, um, you know, uh, we also have this challenge of learning to distinguish the voice of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit versus feelings that, you know, they come from our own soul. We said one very important way is to spend time in the word. Second is to learn from mistakes, right? So, uh, you know, uh, don't be afraid of the mistakes. Understand we're all going through a learning process and um, you learn from those mistakes. And, uh, and uh, that, you know, that is another, that's just a recommendation. It's not uh, a commandment <laughs> that you know usually when we you know when we start something we start small right so instead of trying to you know ask god uh, to speak to you about something you know very big or you know something very major start off with listening to god in small things right and then uh, and and then you will learn to um uh Okay, get disturbing me again. One minute. Okay. All right. So what I was saying is, sorry for these interruptions today. <laughs> um, we will, um, we, so we, we start with something small, right? We start with things that we can manage. An example in the swimming pool, you don't, you know, if somebody's going to learn swimming, they don't go and jump at the deep end. They start off with a small, shallow end. Uh, the shallow end and then they you know they develop the skill and then move on to the deep end so what what we would encourage is as, as we learn to develop our spirit faculties uh, uh you know learn to exercise this in in, in simple things uh, things even if you make a mistake it's not going to be huge in its impact on your life right uh, you you learn to listen to god uh, learn to check whether you know validate okay yes i did hear correctly that is god speaking i'm listening to the holy spirit and uh, and so you know through that you you and i will come to a place where we can be very comfortable to discern the voice of god to discern the voice of the holy spirit and uh, versus what is from our own emotions and if you make mistakes forgive yourself you know take ownership Learn from the mistakes, forgive yourself, understand you're going through a learning process, a training process, and keep going forward. Uh, the same when you're ministering to people, right? Because the same thing happens when we're ministering in the gifts of the Spirit and so on. Uh, we, you know, the, the giver of the gift is perfect and the gift itself is perfect. But we, the human vessels through which the gift is expressed, we are being trained. We are not perfect yet. And so sometimes in our um, ability to hear or maybe even in our ability to express and communicate what we are correctly hearing. So we may be hearing correctly but we may communicate that uh, in some incorrect way. You know, we may use wrong words or we may do something in a, incorrect while communicating it. And so there's nothing wrong with the, the gift. There's nothing wrong with the giver of the gift. It's just that uh, the vessel through whom God is working is still being trained, still learning how to minister. And so even there, you know, you, you, you flow with the Holy Spirit. But if you do make mistakes, accept it, acknowledge it, learn from it, correct yourself, you know, and keep moving forward. A couple of other things I want to share here in this whole uh, section on training the faculties um, is some practical things, okay? Uh, and, and, and please don't take this as, you know, uh, rules, 
Um, these are more like practical guidelines, okay, and which uh, I personally and a lot of other people also, um, you know, would share that, you know, these are some practical things we can do, right? But these are not like commandments of God or anything. They're just guidelines. Um, one is quieten your soul and listen to the Holy Spirit. Um, so that's very important, just to be able to be in a place where your emotions are quiet, right? So now you can be in a very noisy environment, but still be emotionally quiet. Or you can be in a very quiet environment, but there could be a storm inside you emotionally. Both are possible. The key is emotionally to be calm. Right. So that is, I'm talking about your inside, per, your inner person. When our mind and our emotions are calm and not disturbed, it's so much easier to listen to the Holy Spirit. Right? And there could be a lot of noise going around you, but if you and I can learn to be calm on the inside, it makes it easy for us. You know, and that's why many times when I'm go, you know, when I'm going to a service, or when I'm preparing for a service, I don't like to be disturbed and distracted. Like for example, uh, I tell some of my staff, like uh, I tell our accountant, I tell uh, our events manager, please don't disturb me on Saturday. So why? Because Saturday is, is I like to keep the day quiet because I'm preparing for Sunday. Uh, I mean, of course I am, you know, I, I may have to speak to a few people, but I generally I like to keep you know, I don't want, you know, some, some, something that's disturbing that'll agitate my mind and my emotions uh, so that my mind and emotions get preoccupied with that matter instead of focusing on preparing for the time of ministry up ahead on Sunday. So they know that unless it's an emergency, you know, they don't call or message me on Saturday because um, they know, okay, unless it's an emergency. So there are certain things you just do, just to quieten yourself before God so that you can listen to the Holy Spirit. Now, that does not mean you cannot listen to God when, you know, you're in a, when you're in a, say, a busy place. No, you can't. The key is inside your mind, your emotions should be still, be calm. Right? The Bible tells us, be still and know that I am God. Right. So part of knowing uh, is be before you, you knowing comes that being still so that's very important second thing is um again this is not a rule but this is just a practical thing is the first voice is god's voice now why do we say that many times you know when you're listening to god and you say god uh please tell me you know what should i say or speak or do or so on uh, the first voice, the thing that comes to you immediately at that moment is God. And then what usually what happens is when you take that and you start processing with your mind, many other ideas come in, so on and so forth. And sometimes contrary ideas come in, contrary, you kind of reason, reason. And many times we reason ourselves out of what God has actually spoken. Right. So you must learn to go with the first voice. But of course, there are qualifiers to it. But the first voice is God's voice. You know, this um, example, just give you a simple example. You know, for this last one, two weeks, maybe last two weeks, every day at eight o'clock in the morning, um, uh, at eight o'clock in the morning, I, I have to make a call. I'm calling somebody. I, 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 I want to pray with that person, um, you know, one minute, somebody is disturbing me right now. I need to, one minute. Sorry. So the last two weeks, uh, every morning at eight o'clock, I need to uh, call somebody. If somebody's just they're going to getting ready for a medical procedure and so on. And so um, 
Maybe you set up this time that I call them, uh, share the word of God with them, pray with them, uh, just to encourage their faith and, and, and just believe God for healing and, and, and so on. Now, here's some very simple thing. This is a very simple thing, right? Okay, we have, we have, we're believing God for healing, we want to encourage the faith for healing. Uh, eight o'clock every morning, I have to do that. Now, every day, I just say, God, what should I speak to this person? And I just kind of put my spiritual antennas up. And the first word that comes to my spirit, that's what I go with. Right? Because I know the first voice is God's voice. Right? So I don't try to like reason myself out of that. You know, and, and um, uh, of course, th this is a husband-wife couple that I call every morning, 8 o'clock. So I just yesterday, I think it was yesterday, you know, um, I, I uh, just, okay, God just reminded me of the scripture. So then I, uh, so at eight o'clock when I call, I said, okay, we're going to read this scripture that today. And then after I finish sharing, then the wife, the, she's the one who's going to, you know, uh, be building, ministering healing for her. She said, you know, this is, this word is so encouraging. Uh, this, this reminds, you know, it just reminded her of certain things that God had done in her life, etc. So, you know, there's always this confirmation that you share a word, it ministers to them and they're encouraged. But then how do you receive that? Part? You know, there's so many scriptures, there's so many things you can do. And of course you can take anything and share it. I'm sure it'll bless people. But then you want to know, what am I supposed to share today? Well, put your antennas out, ask God, Lord, what do, I, what do you want me to share? The first word that comes, the first voice is God's voice. Just take it, lock into it, right? And don't reason yourself out of it. Now here, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, uh, some major decision because in some situations you need to validate those things. But here I'm talking about, you know, what do I say to this person or what am I supposed to do? So in those situations, this the simple guideline helps a lot, right? The first voice is God's voice. So you, the moment something comes into your spirit, you know, you go with it okay? or something uh, you, you're praying about something. The moment you're praying and you, you put your antennas out, that means you're, you're ready to see, hear, or feel that God may speak to you through any one of these channels. You're ready to see, hear, or feel. What comes into your spirit, you take it and you go with it. Okay? So the first voice is God's voice. Let me just cover this and then I will take up the questions um, that uh, come up. Right? And then, let me... Then, uh, uh, just some other guidelines here is, uh, get out of your mind to flow with the Spirit. So, obviously, God has given us our mind. We must use our mind, but we must also be willing to go out of our mind. That means there are times when you, you don't kind of understand everything, but you just step out because you've, you, you, you know you've heard from God in your spirit. And even if your mind cannot, you know, it doesn't sound logical and so on you're stepping out of your mind right? that means your spirit is overriding your mind now i'm not saying we should you know uh, be like this all the time now we are using our mind uh, our intellect because god gave it to us but remember that god is bigger than our mind and that some of the things god may instruct us to do or speak to us cannot be fully explained with the information that we have that is with our own uh, ability and intellect, right? So be willing to step out of your mind in order to flow with the Holy Spirit, right? Um, and another guideline we can use is uh, if you're unsure about something, you share or you discuss it with some people, uh, you validate it, you know, so you can ask them, hey, uh, this is what I feel. Um, what do you think it's all right? So you have a conversation with one or two people who can help you. Um, discern whether what you're hearing uh, is is from God, or you you validate it with the scriptures. You know what does the Bible say about this? Is it right or is it wrong? Right? So you're validating it. Um, so everything we hear from God, of course, has to be validated with the scriptures. We don't want to do anything that contradicts the scriptures. But uh, so when, whatever I've said earlier is like the first voice is God's voice, or you know you you go beyond your mind. All of that is within the perimeters of the written scriptures. Okay, we are not we are not going to violate God's written scriptures, right? That's our guideline. Uh, 
The last thing is to keep in mind that um, God can touch our soul and body. So sometimes, so while we're talking about training our spirit faculties, what we see here and feel uh, in our spirit, remember that sometimes this God can communicate through our soul and body. So sometimes it can become through your emotions or your body, but everything again has to be tested and validated. So I'm not ruling out the fact that God could touch our body directly or emo emotions that can happen. But in this course, we are intentionally focusing on our human spirit. And that's the primary way that God is going to be, uh, the primary area where God is going to be speaking to us. So I'm going to pause here for now and see, just take up some questions before we go into the next chapter. All right. Uh, did somebody put up their hand or I heard a ping. So any questions so far? Everybody's with me. Master, I have one uh, mm -hmm. doubt. Uh, mm -hmm. when, when we were talking about uh, how do we initially train ourselves, uh, uh, how do we, like, we, we have now foreseen five points on how we can identify whether God is speaking or we are speaking or how to go ahead and test it. But uh, initially, mm -hmm. when we are trying for it, uh, how do we understand uh, means if we, whether we asked or whether we haven't asked, we are waiting uh, in front of God and uh, we are receiving something. Um, how do we uh, validate it within ourselves? Is it mm. uh, what I actually wanted to hear? Or is it God speaking, I am speaking, or any anything else is influencing my thought? Mm, mm, mm. Okay. So, good question. So, let's, let's take an example that, um, you know, we have to make a decision about something and uh, you're going before God. First thing is to come to a neutral place, right? Emotionally come to a neutral place. That means if in to make this decision, there's a, let's say there are three options. Okay, I'm just creating a scenario to create, give us an example. So let's say I have to make a decision and there are, I have three options in front of me, A, B, and C. And uh, my personal preference is B. My option is I like B, uh, but I don't know, uh, but I want God, God's guidance because I may personally like B, but I don't know, you know, what would be the, the, the future? What would be the, the outcome? Or is that what God wants? What if God wants A for me? Or if he wants me to choose C, right? So in this decision, so the first thing is to come to a place where I'm neutral. That means I say, God, uh, I need to make this decision. I have these three options in front of me. Uh, you know, I, I personally like B, but I really want to know what you would like me to choose, or what you, do you want me to do? Which way do you want me to go? Right? And I'm ready to go with whatever you tell me. Right? So you're acknowledging to God that, yeah, I like B, but uh, I, I, more important than my liking is, I want your guidance. I want your wisdom in this decision because you know uh, I know that when God leads us, that will always work out good, right? So you, the first thing is just bring us, bring, bring. I, I need to bring myself to a neutral place where I'm ready, and for me the priority is I want to hear from God. I want God's guidance. Now, uh, if if possible, right? There may be some situations where. I can get counsel, I can get input, I can get information about the right decision. So I go through that process because God uh, may use that to help me, right? Uh, and God has given us the opportunity to do that. He has given us our mind, right? And some situations that will not be available. That means, you know, you have to make a decision. There is no information available. Nobody who can give you any counsel. In some situations, there will be. And if, for example, there is that opportunity to get some information, make some, you know, get some input, okay, you do that. That's being responsible, 
right? So God, okay, I've thought through this. I've also, you know, spoken to some people. I got this information. And according to this information, I should choose B. So uh, both my personal liking is to choose B. According to whatever information I've gathered, it, the, the recommendation is I should choose B. But Lord, I want your guidance. So I've done my part. I'm not being an ir irresponsible person. I've done my part but I'm coming before God for guidance. And that's where, you know, the Bible tells us, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, he will direct your paths. So you're saying, God, I've done my work uh, and processed things, but uh, I need, I want your guidance. So then you pray. And then uh, as you, you know, you're, you're, you're praying and, and God could speak to us so many different ways. Uh, it, it could come through what you see, what you hear, you, what you feel. Sometimes he can speak to you through the written scriptures, so on. So you're just praying about it. Uh, sometimes the moment you pray, a clear answer is there, right? You feel in your heart, okay, I need to choose A uh, and I need to go that way. Or sometimes you may have to, you know, you pray over it a few days until there is, you know, a, a clear indication. Now, what, what, what are some of the factors? One is, uh, you know, what, what, you know, you, you, you know that God has clearly indicated to you, choose A. Some, that could be one thing. Or he could, there could be a peace about it. Okay? That means when you think about B, you don't feel very disturbed, even though all the indications and your personal preferences be, but there's, you don't feel peace about it. You think about C, and again, you don't feel peace about it. But when you think about A, there is the sense of God's peace. So that's that feeling we're talking about, the feeling of peace. It's okay, I feel peaceful. So the God's, God's peace is there concerning this. So I should go with A, right? Uh, so, Sometimes God could just put a word in your spirit, choose A. It could be come, come through that feeling of peace. Uh, or God could, you know, uh, uh, give you a vision, a picture of what will happen if you choose A or B or C. You know, so, it, so many, it could come in so many different ways. But then you feel, in, finally, there's this understanding and there's this peace that, look, this is the way to go about A. Now, then what you do, you go and validate it. You go and, you know, okay, I feel I should go for A. Now let me explore. Let me test the waters, right? So you validate it. Can I proceed with A? The door, then you see the doors opening up. Right? Things are falling in place. So then it's like you're confirming what you've heard. And then you begin to move like that. So that's just, you know, just a scenario. I'm not saying the scenario addresses every kind of scenario, scenario we face, but um, we, we, we go before God, we learn to listen to him and he can communicate to us through many different ways. Sometimes you're reading the scripture and through the scriptures, God can speak to you, uh, direct your paths and so on. And then you, you look for the peace of God in your heart. You may look for more information or guidance and so on and then you proceed is that okay i try to put it together thank you pastor small, uh, it, uh, it did give me clarity and uh, uh, i also had another doubt uh, there are something that we call fr from bible that we need to walk by faith there are times uh, that uh, you don't uh, hear or uh, god is silent or uh, i do not know means how to explain that but then there are times that you have to step, uh, take a step of uh, boldness and faith and then uh, because sometimes God will not reveal everything. He will just, uh, he will just wa want you to walk by faith. So how do we identify if at all uh, I, I haven't heard from God, I should wait or should I step out by faith? The, yeah, the answer is quite simple. Faith can only be had when you have the word. Faith comes by hearing the word. If you haven't heard the word, 
we can't have faith. So to walk by faith, you first have to hear the word. So if God wants you to step out in faith, the first thing he gives is the word. Otherwise, you can't take the step of faith because faith comes by hearing the word. So if you haven't heard a word, don't take any step because you can't step out by faith. So the first thing is you have to hear the word. What does God want you to do? Right? So you pray or you read the scriptures. You receive the word, then take the step of faith. If you haven't had the word, don't take any step. Thank you, Pastor. That's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, um, Kennedy, please kindly give direction by listening to the still voice, how you can validate it to know what that it is not of the devil. All right, so the still voice is just the inner witness of the Holy Spirit in our spirit, right? The spirit bears witness with our spirit. So it's what you're hearing in your spirit through what you see, feel, or hear. So that's a still small voice. It's the Holy Spirit speaking to your spirit through your spirit faculties. Now, like we said, you validate it with the written scriptures. So if the Holy Spirit is speaking, he will never contradict the written scriptures. Second, the peace of God, right? So whatever you're hearing, sensing, feeling, there must be the accompanying peace because the peace of God rules your heart. Right? The third is we can do other kinds of validation, like I mentioned, and I'm not saying you can always do this, but when if you have the opportunity, then do it, which is talk to somebody else. You know, get the input of somebody spiritual. I say, look, this is what I'm saying, feeling in my spirit. What do you think? That means somebody else is looking at that and telling you, speaking to you based on the word. Of course, they have to be godly spiritual people and they can validate, right? And the, the Bible says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So you're having somebody else bear witness to what you feel you're receiving as a witness to the Holy Spirit. Now, the reason I say in some situations you cannot do it is maybe there is nobody else that you can talk to or uh, who would be able to relate to what you're saying. So then you just have to depend on what God is saying. But if you have the chance, and now most of us are part of local churches and we have God's you know, brothers around us, people we know who are journeying with us and uh, we can always share and ask them for their counsel. And so that's a good thing to do, right? to have, have somebody else in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So those are some quick ways by which we can discern or validate whether what we are receiving as an inner witness is of God or not. The word, the peace, and the confirmation through other people. Is that okay, Kennedy? Okay, fine. Oh, okay, Abinas, you have a, a question. Go ahead, please. Yes, Pastor, thank you. So, Pastor, my question is like, sometimes uh, I used to see some reality shows, like let's say uh, AGD, American God Talent, and I see the good things, but sometimes I see the magicians, like they do some unusual and shocking things. So I just want to know, Pastor, like uh, from where they get strength and which spirit they carry to do such things. So that's my question, Pastor. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I'm not a magician and I don't know too much about magic, but I'm just sharing my thoughts, okay? And my thoughts may be at a baby level. I'm not an expert on this. Um, my thinking is, uh, one is some of the, some of the quote-unquote magic things are just tricks, right? So they can do the tricks and they do it well. So that's one side. And second, of course, is uh, 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 these, there could be demonic powers that 
seemingly demonstrates super that demonstrates supernatural things. So some of the magic would just be playing tricks that people play, uh, and then there is some some part of the magic which is, or some things that people do, which would be of course demonic or supernatural, but in the dark sense. So these would broadly speaking to categories. Now I'm not. I mean, I, you know, um, we can't. Uh, these are just general guidelines. So when you when you're, when you're seeing something, you know, either it falls in this category of okay, it's a nice trick, uh, and there's a way to do it, or when somebody demonstrates something supernatural that's not from God, then obviously it's empowered by spirits, demonic powers that are working, lying signs and wonders. So that's how we will look at those things. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now we're going to go into uh, the next section, which I want to talk about, which is, it kind of overlaps with what I've just shared. It is the seven functions of the human spirit. That means God has put the human spirit or God has created the human spirit and, and, and it is part of our makeup. We are spirit, soul, and body. The body has certain functions. The soul has its functions. So also the human spirit being inside you has certain functions. And uh, I've put them down as seven functions. Uh, I will, uh, I'll, I'll share it as, as a quick note here. Um, and uh, then I will give you the, uh, the um, PDF in an expanded form in, uh, in the notes, okay? So I just wanna go with these seven functions here. So what are the seven functions that we can see in scripture uh, of the human spirit? And I'm specifically talking about the born again human spirit. Okay, that means I'm talking about in a believer. Now remember, even an unsaved person, unbeliever has the human spirit, but it would be in a different condition, right? His, his, his spirit is in a different condition. It's, it's not regenerated, it's not born again. It doesn't have the life of God. It doesn't have uh, the, the Holy Spirit indwelling. It does, you know, and so the condition of the human spirit in an unsaved person is different. But here we are talking about that of a believer. And so everything we are saying now is in connection to the functions of the human spirit in a believer. First one is conscience. Conscience is telling us what is right and what's wrong. Okay. So the human spirit is like um, uh, 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 an inbuilt or a built-in judge sitting there or t inside us telling us this is right, this is wrong. Right? And how is that possible? Because the Bible tells us that God has programmed the human spirit with the law of God. That's Romans chapter 2. Right, verse 15, I think it is, that the human spirit has been pre-programmed with the law of God. Now, of course, over time, the conscience can, the Bible talks about it as being seared with a hot iron. That means it's been destroyed. Okay, that means its ability to tell you right and wrong is either distorted or completely damaged, which is true in the case of many unsaved people. And sometimes, sadly, becomes true in believers. That means they are not living with a good conscience or a clear conscience. And we're talking about believers. That even believers have damaged their own conscience or suppressed their own conscience. Example. You see, a believer, he loves Jesus. He was wonderful. 
he can pray in tongues and all of that. He can, God is using him. He's anointed, everything wonderful. Suppose he gets tempted to do something wrong. It could be in any area. It could be in money. It could be in, you know, in wrong relationships. It could be in what, whatever, any area. He feels tempted to do something wrong. Now he is a wonderful believer. God is working in his life, everything. But he's feeling tempted. The first thing is his conscience tells him that is wrong. Even before, you know, uh, he, he can pray about it or even before anything, his conscience is telling him that is wrong. You, you should not do that. Maybe he's ill-treating somebody. Maybe he is stealing money from whatever. You know, he's doing something wrong, whatever it is. His conscience is telling him, don't do it. But what happens? He excuses his own conscience. He makes excuse. And sometimes the excuse could be very spiritual. You see, I mean, an example of an excuse could be, you know, after all, I'm doing so much good for the kingdom of God. If I do a little wrong, it's okay. My good outdoes all these mistakes. Or I deserve the luxury of doing this wrong thing. Or, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. You know, whatever. You know, he's excusing his own conscience. But his conscience is telling him it's wrong. And the, the, the normal thing is that the Holy Spirit, the voice of the Spirit, accompanies the conscience. And not only is the conscience telling him it's wrong, the Holy Spirit is telling him it's wrong, but he's choosing to excuse his conscience and not listen to the Holy Spirit. And so he continues that way. What happens? He damages his own conscience. And if he continues doing this, he will soon live with a damaged conscience. To the point where a believer can do things which you know, you're looking at and you're saying, how did he even bring himself to do this? How did he bring himself to do something like why? Well, the reason is over time he damaged his own conscience. There was nothing inside him to guide, to be a judge inside him telling him, don't do it. He had suppressed the voice of his own conscience. But the conscience is a built-in function of the human spirit. And for the voice of the conscience to be, to, to be always there, we need to maintain a clear conscience. Don't let anything, you know, uh, uh, don't let anything uh, cloud the voice of your conscience. Keep it clean before God. Listen to your conscience. The Apostle Paul, you know, he said, I have lived in all good conscience before God and man. This is Acts 22. When he's standing before King Agrippa, he says, I lived in all good conscience. All right, so conscience is very important. The second function of the human spirit is knowledge or growing in knowledge or growing in knowing, right? It's acquiring spiritual knowledge or growing in knowledge. You know, it, it says about Jesus, this is in Luke chapter two. It's talking about Jesus and the child grew in wisdom and in stature. So Jesus, he grew in his spirit. He grew in wisdom. Think about it. That means this is the omniscient God. When he became man, he didn't bring his omniscience with him. He laid his omniscience aside. That means he started from zero. The all-knowing God started from zero. So it's hard for our minds to think about it. He knew everything. 
But when he became a human, he had to grow in wisdom, in the spirit, spiritual. Of course, naturally he grew in stature. I mean, he also grew naturally. But you're talking about spirit, spirit. And like Jesus, we have to grow in spirit. So the Bible talks about the triune God, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So God the Father was in heaven, deity. God the Spirit, deity. But the God the eternal word, when he became a man, he laid aside his omniscience. So God was always there in heaven. Like, don't, don't mistake me. Or God never ceased being God. He was there, God the Father and God the Spirit. But God the eternal word, when he took on humanity, he didn't cease being deity. He laid aside his powers of deity. So the Bible is very clear. The Bible presents a triune God, Godhead, Romans chapter 1. So Jesus grew in wisdom. That means in his humanity, he had to grow spiritually. In wisdom. That's why Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4 says God the Father woke him up morning by morning and he taught him. He opened his ear to hear as a learned. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4, 5 and 6. That means God the Father was teaching God the Son. That's why in John chapter 8 and in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, whatever I've heard of the Father, I'm speaking. What I've been taught by the Father, I'm speaking. So you imagine this. It's so hard to, to, for our minds to grasp that the omniscient God in his humanity had to increase in knowledge and he was taught by the Father. And the omni, omnipotent God in his humanity had to walk under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, God the Spirit. Okay. This is something we, we need to understand, right? Christology um, or, or understanding Trinity. But getting back to the point, our human spirit must grow in knowledge. It's designed to increase in knowledge. And the best example is Jesus Christ when he walked on the earth. He increased in knowledge. So you, also, you and I must also increase in knowledge, spiritual knowledge in our spirit. That's the second function of the human spirit. Are you all with me so far? Yes, Pastor. Okay. All right. Okay. I now I am going to take extra time today, if it's okay with you, and finish this. Um, is it okay if I take a little bit of extra time? Do you want to break and come back, or can I should we continue? I, I'm open with both options. Do you want a ten minute break or a five minute break? I'll, I'll just take maybe another twenty thirty minutes. Um, or if, if, you, if you cannot stay, you can always listen to the recording, uh, you know, uh, at a later time. Okay, the recording will be on the classroom. So uh, I know if you, if you need to leave, uh, you can leave and uh, you can always listen to the recording. Okay, uh, it, yeah, you won't get upset or anything. Uh, I'll just continue. And, uh, and then thank you. I, I thank you for your feedback. Right, uh, I, I will continue. Uh, and so we can finish the class, the course today. If anybody needs to leave, if you have something else planned, uh, please feel free to leave and you can just continue. You can listen to the recording and that will be available. Okay. Second function of the human spirit is knowing. So our spirit must grow in spiritual knowledge. And I was just pointing to the Lord Jesus as our example. The third function of the human spirit, I'm talking about again, the believer, is communion with God. How do we commune with God? That is fellowship with God in our spirit. The Bible tells us that we are called to fellowship with the Father, with the Son, with the Holy Spirit. First John chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3. We are fellowship with the Father and with the Son. 
Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. We have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. That word fellowship in the Greek is communion. So as a believer, you and I must fellowship with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Okay. With the triune God. I've given you some scriptures on that. Now, how can we fellowship with God? God is spirit. Therefore, your human spirit, one of the functions is to fellowship with God or spirit. We don't fellowship with God with our bodies. Right? Because, you know, I can't see God. I can't have a cup of tea. Now, when we have fellowship in church, we can sit, we can talk, we can see each other physically. We have conversation. But we can't do that with God. God is spirit. So how do you commune with God? Spirit must commune with spirit. So your human spirit, one of the functions of your human spirit is communion with God. Spirit to spirit. So, in our spirit, we worship. We commune. The word communion means to share everything. To share everything. How do I share everything with God? Spirit to spirit. Now that sharing, of course, is expressed through words, through song, through prayer, uh, even through your thoughts. So God knows our thoughts. So even through your thoughts, you're communing with God. But that constant communion is something we must maintain in our spirit. Spirit to spirit. Communion. With God. Fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Through your thoughts, through your words, through your feelings. Communion with God. And in that communion, God also shares. Because communion is not a one-way thing, it's two-way. So God shares Himself with you. So you receive His strength. You receive his wisdom, you receive uh, revelation, and so on. But God is sharing with you, you are sharing with him. Spirit to spirit. Communion. Communion happens by just waiting in his presence. Uh, you just, you know, you just spend time in his presence, communion happens. Okay. So you can think about two people who are trying to build friendship, right? They sit together, they talk, they share their ideas, they may do some things together, they may plan some things together. What are they doing? They're building relationships. So communion in the spiritual is building relationship with God in a similar manner. The fourth function of your human spirit is it's a container. So uh, uh, the Bible uses the word vessel earthen vessel, clay vessel. It's a vessel. That means it's a container. That means God fills it up and it your contains. And of course, the container then is used to pour out. Right? It is used to release. It is used to give out. But the spirit is the human spirit is the container. It's a container of the life of God, the grace of God, the power of God, the glory of God. It means all who God is, he puts himself into you. But where? In your human spirit. So that from there, you can release. Jesus said it like this in John 7. He said, out of your innermost being, that is your human spirit, will flow rivers of living water. So there is, is, the picture is like a channel, but the idea is this, God pours himself into your spirit and then from your spirit, he flows. 
to others. Or Second Timothy, you know, Paul uses just the language. He says, whoever will cleanse himself from whatever is unclean or dishonorable, he will be a vessel of honor. So using the word vessel, the vessel of honor, sanctified and fit for the master's use and ready for every good work. You're being a vessel. Second Corinthians 4, Paul says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. So God's treasure in earthen vessels, earthen vessels. Of course, part of the indication is, yeah, we are earthen vessels. We are, we are, we are, we are mortal. But the real vessel, which part of us is the spirit, the human spirit. That's the container that God pours himself. And then through us, he releases out. So, think about this. If the container is filled with junk, with other kinds of things, there's not too much space for what God wants to put in. Okay, So, uh, let me put it in a positive way. We need to keep our vessel clean and full of God. That's why in Paul's writings, he says, I pray that you may be filled with the fullness of God. The term fullness of God is something very unique uh, to Paul's, the Apostle Paul's writings. He says, I want you to, I pray that you will be filled with the fullness of God. What part of us is going to be filled with the fullness of God? Our spirit. And out of that fullness, like Jesus, he said, you know, in John 1, out of his fullness, we have all received grace for grace. That means Jesus came full of God and out of his fullness, he gave. Same thing with you and me. We, our spirit must be filled with God so that out of that fullness, we can give. And you can never give what you don't have. Right? So, your human spirit is a container. It is up to you and me to make sure that we are filled with the fullness of God, the, the virtues of God, the grace of God, the love of God. So as we commune with God, God fills us up with himself that we are able to dispense that to others. So there's this flow. Number five. The human spirit carries identity. It's part of the function. That means this is who you really are, your identity. And that identity is granted to you and me in the spirit. It's given to us by God the moment we are born again. Because God placed us in Christ. The, the challenge is to grow in spiritual knowing of our identity so that we can live out of that identity. That identity is given to the human spirit, but the human spirit needs to grow in its knowing of its identity. Now you can think about it in the natural. When I am born in this country, my, my identity is given to me, my natural identity. You are an Indian. It's given. By birth. And everything about being Indian is available to me by birth. I was born in this country. But I need to grow in my understanding. What does it mean to be a citizen of this country? Oh. What must I do? What must I not do? Uh, you know, I must learn. It, it's a, it's a, the knowing is a growing process. It's a, it's, a, it's a process. But identity, who you are in Christ, is given to your spirit. And it's a complete identity. You know, I'm not like half citizen of India. No, you're born here. You're given the full citizenship. It's like that. You're born, in, you're born again. You're, you're given a full identity in Christ. 
but you need to know it and live out of it. But your spirit carries identity. And we have to learn how to live out of that spiritual identity. And that's a function of the human spirit. Your identity in the spiritual world belongs to your human spirit and has been given by God. Number six is action. That means your human spirit can take action. Just like in the physical, my body can do things in the natural realm. You know, so your body has strength, uh, you can do things, take action. Now you have to think about your human spirit with that same function or capacity that your human spirit can take action in things in the spiritual realm by believing, by serving, interceding, fighting, or speaking words from your spirit, words of faith. Those are actions that your spirit is taking that will cause things to happen in the spiritual realm and also impact the natural realm. So your human spirit can do things in the spiritual world. And what you affect in the spiritual world will have its repercussions in the natural world. But taking action by your human spirit in the spiritual realm happens through words you speak, through believing, through declaring, through interceding, uh, to engaging in the spiritual realm. But that's your human spirit taking action. That's what Paul said in Romans chapter 1. He says, we serve God in the spirit. So ministry is really a spiritual thing. It's a work of your human spirit. We serve God in the spirit. And of course, you know, we, we take action in the natural. But remember, it's first and foremost a spiritual work. The last one, the seventh function, ultimately, your human spirit is a person. It's you, the real person. And that person is becoming like Jesus. You and I are being conformed to the image of his son. And this conformance is not out external. It's not like, you know, my facial face is being changed to be like Jesus. That's not it. The human spirit, the real person on the inside is growing. The growth is happening. And that growth is measured by how much more like Jesus I am becoming. And that's happening to the human spirit. So these are the seven functions of your human spirit. So we talked about the faculties, but then it's all working towards this. Your human spirit is serving as your conscience. It's growing in spiritual knowledge. It's communing with the Father. It's the container of the things of God through which it's released here on earth. It has carries your real identity. It is what can do things in the spiritual realm. And it is also being changed into the image. Of Jesus Christ. Those are the functions. And in one of the earlier chapters, we talked about dev, uh, developing the spirit. What can we do? So everything we do, we mentioned seven things there. Everything you're doing in developing your spirit is going to help sharpen those five faculties, and it's going to build you in these seven functions, what your human spirit is really supposed to do inside you in these seven functions. So as we practice those things on developing the spirit, our faculties are being trained, and we are growing in these seven functions. It's getting stronger and stronger. So I hope you're seeing the connection between 
the seven things we do to develop the spirit and the faculties being sharpened or trained and what your human spirit will be strengthened to express in you the functions of the spirit but if you don't do that which is feeding ourselves in the word and praying in the spirit and so on then we'll be weak the human's function of the human spirit will be weak and uh, you know the believer's life will be weak he'll still be a believer he's still going to heaven he's still saved but this human spirit is not strong the spirit is not strong because the functions are not being developed and the faculties are not being trained inside him okay and the last thought i want to leave with us is that we can impart spirit to spirit that means what god gives to you spiritually you can pass on to others imparting just like in the natural you know uh, if you have something you can give it so if you have a little money you can give some money to somebody if you have you know five fruits you can give four fruits to others and need one yourself <laughs> whatever you know what you have you can give and it's true of the spirit if your human spirit is developed you're trained and your functions are being built that what you have you can give to others you can pass it on you can share with them and the process of impartation happens usually through training you train them you explain to others you know, this one. you train them you train others it happens through association that as you spend time with people they catch what you have and then there are times god does the impartation that means god takes from you and puts it on them that's called impartation takes puts but it also happens through training and association but the point is this as you develop yourself spiritually give it to other people just like in the natural if god gives you something what do you do you of course you 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 enjoy but you also think of okay i can give some to some other people that's in the natural same thing in the spiritual as god gives you in the spiritual as you're developing in the spirit think about giving imparting or passing it on or sharing it or transferring it to other people then you strengthen other people spiritually okay so with this we will finish this course i'm going to answer we'll take up some questions uh, i see kennedy's question at what point do we quench the spirit good question so the bible tells us right first thessalonians 5 do not despise prophecies yeah test all things hold fast to what is good and in that context he says do not quench the spirit ephesians 4 he says do not grieve the holy spirit in acts 7 he talks about fighting with the spirit anyway so what happens is the holy spirit is communicating to our human spirit when he communicates to our spirit if we shut him down if we suppress him that's quenching when he's communicating to our spirit if we disobey him we grieve him or we do something that pleases him, displeases him we grieve him and hopefully don't we don't do this but the holy spirit is speaking and we 
fight back. That is, we strive against the Holy Spirit. So we don't want to quench. We don't want to grieve. And we don't want to be striving against the Holy Spirit. So what must we do? We must learn to be sensitive to the Spirit. As he speaks, even the smallest prompting, do it. Yield to it. We will make sure that we don't quench, we don't grieve, and we don't strive against the Holy Spirit. Okay? Okay. So Maxon's question, how to reinstall when the conscience is destroyed? Right. So very good question. So we said the conscience has been pre-programmed with the law of God. And the way to, and, and, and usually, you know, because of all, all that we go through in life, our conscience is seared. So the way we re, re, uh, um, you know, our repro, pro, reprogram or get it fixed is by the word of God. Right? So in Hebrews chapter 10, God says, I will write my word upon their hearts and on their minds. So the writing of the word of God into our hearts is really reestablishing or it is strengthening the conscience, the voice of the spirit. Okay. So that's an important, that's why even the word, the word of God, just filling our spirit with the word of God is like you're strengthening your conscience. It's like you're, you're feeding your conscience with the right things for reprogramming it, making it clean, clear, clear, uh, getting out all the clutter and all the wrong things that may have damaged it so that now your conscience tells you this is right, this is wrong. And, 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 and even the, the faintest thing can, your conscience will awaken and say, this is right, this is wrong. But it's God writing his word into our hearts. Okay. All right. Everyone with me so far? Uh, any uh, You followed? I know I've compressed a lot of information today, uh, but uh, I will just put out the PDF notes and you think about it, feed on it, and chew on it, and uh, strengthen yourself. And hopefully we'll have this whole thing out as a complete book and so you can read it and, and in an expanded form and, you know, continue to grow. In this okay um, we're going to close so with this we conclude this course on developing the human spirit uh, I will put out a simple assignment for you and you can work on it submit it in uh, there'll just be multiple choice questions it's an open book open Bible open notes and everything except that you can't do it as a group <laughs> just do it individually uh, and just for you to review the the content and get a grade okay uh, so we'll do that and we'll conclude the course with that uh, but i hope to be able to put all these things down in a in a good book in a in an expanded way so that you know you can read the book we'll send you an email when the book's available and uh, uh, it'll be a, a tool that you can study the subject further uh, and of course i myself i'm learning searching understanding so I'm sure we will keep learning more things um, in this area. Okay. Uh, thanks for being on the course and thanks for all the questions you ask. You know, every question you ask uh, kind of uh, helps me as well. It helps me think and, uh, and, and see what, you know, what, what we need to explain, what we need to clarify. So you asking questions is a good thing and it's going to, it helps the course. We're going to close in prayer. I'm, I'm just going to uh, ask some anyone uh, to please pray with us. And with that, we will close the course. Uh, I want to say thank you also for giving this extra time uh, today so that we could finish up. Could anybody please uh, pray for the whole class? And uh, please close the course for all of us. Father God, we thank you. For all these days that we have been able to learn from Pastor 
as you guided him, as your spirit enabled him, how we have to develop our human spirit so that, Lord, we are able to receive from you the perfect guidance, you know your perfect will, and to also, Lord, as we have received, as we have understood today, Lord, that we will be, we, uh, all the uh, functions that we are able to do because our human spirit is developed, Lord, that we will do it so that we will be a channel of your blessing to everyone around and every place that we go. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we pray that all of us will be able to develop our human spirit each day of our life, for every day is a, a phase of our growing from glory to glory. Mm. I pray, Lord, that we will all be able to be fruit bearers in your kingdom. And we thank you, Lord, for Pastor, for uh, all the efforts that he and everyone in the Bible College puts in to help each one of us to grow spiritually as your children, as your ministers, uh, so that your kingdom is established in this earth, wherever we are placed and planted. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Um, enjoy your um, rest of the day, rest of the week, uh, the summer break that you will have after we finish. And uh, Look forward to seeing you all next semester. It starts August 1st. Uh, look forward to a great time. Look forward to a great time together. God bless. Thank you. See you again. Bye. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Thank you.